have the beautiful honor of introducing Mr. Derek St. Pierre, who has made sure that many patients in this room got a return of medicine. So for that, we thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, before I came tonight, I was kind of emailed a list of six or seven questions. I've kind of pared them down to three and then ha happy to take questions after that. Um, I'm just going to kind of run through those three because I think they're very uh, timely and, you know, kind of relevant to the particular group we have here. First one is, what are we seeing with our current district attorney? Well, our current district attorney is very vocally supportive of medical marijuana. However, um, in terms of practically speaking, seeing what's going on at the office day to day, I will say in terms of individuals being prosecuted, there are a very low number of individuals that can actually show their medical documentation that are prosecuted for personal possession. That doesn't mean that that you know, stops the initial uh, police encounter where you get arrested if you don't have your paperwork on you, but if you subsequently are able to provide that paperwork, uh, the district attorney's office is in fact dismissing almost all of these cases <coughs> when it comes down to just personal possession. And what do I mean? Let's say you, you know, get arrested, they cite you for a, a day to appear, show up to court that day, bring your documentation, your ID, DA will dismiss these cases. Um, so I really don't want to focus too much on the personal possession, except what I will say is driving in the car, having marijuana in an actual vehicle, really works to your disadvantage because it gives them any number of excuses to actually go through your entire vehicle. Let's just say you have, you know, your own small personal amount. I would highly recommend, you know, putting it in a trunk or putting it in a sealed container so that, let's say you get pulled over for speeding, illegal right turn, whatever, you don't end up with a situation where they're then, oh, do I smell something or were you smoking just before you started driving? It becomes kind of one of those, you know, uh, never-ending series of questions that once you're starting going down that slippery slope, it's already starting to go the wrong way. So just highly recommend in terms of a vehicle, really, you know, make a little bit of an effort to contain or, you know, put your marijuana someplace. So if you do have the unfortunate law enforcement encounter, it doesn't turn into more than a speeding ticket or whatever it started off as. Um, in terms of actual grows, how is our current district attorney? Um, our current district attorney, again, is taking a relatively, you know, it has a very vocally supportive medical marijuana um, approach. It is election season. Everybody's going to, uh, you know, take that high road and say, oh, we're 100% supportive <coughs> medical cannabis. I can tell you from my experience that unless, a, you know, the actual gardener and garden is documented very well, has enough supporting paperwork, they're still coming in and cutting those things down. And um, it's also one of those dynamics that if you don't have everything mounted on the wall and is, you know, current as in not expired, police are going to go through it all, do a plant count, throw away their uh, expired prescriptions, and then, you know, you go from there and you're then having a conversation, oh, you have two valid recommendations and, you know, 150 plants. That just doesn't really add up for, you know, the officers. So, um, in order to minimize your officer experience, stay on top of your paperwork, in order to, if you've already gotten past the officer experience and it is at the district attorney's office, I will say that, you know, the district attorney, if you're able to uh, provide them up-to-date recommendations and really kind of substantiate the actual uh, relationship you have, then there is largely going to be a dismissal. The big catch there is this. Do not, under any circumstances, start having a conversation with the police about how much you receive in remuneration, how much you pay for expenses, how much cash you ever got from anybody, because what they're trying to Wait, do... how much cash you ever got from anybody? What, what they're trying to do is actually uh, start you down the uh, <laughs> slope of, oh yeah, I just got my expenses covered, oh yeah, I got this amount. Next thing you know, they're charging you with sales, and that's the only people they're actively prosecuting in the city, is they can actually show you're making a profit. Doesn't mean that, you know, let's say I, I sold a pound for X amount, and literally it cost me that exact amount in terms of time, expenses, labor. They are factoring that in. So don't even have the money conversation with the police whatsoever. Just not worth your time. Um, so that's, you know, my truncated version on current policy of the DA. Second one was, what to do if your provider is arrested? 
What questions should you answer regarding your provider? Well, it doesn't really happen so much in this city, but I will say for a fact it happens all the time in other counties. Somebody's garden gets arrested, they have, you know, 15, uh, you know, patient uh, recommendations up on the wall. It's not going to be the same night as the raid, but two, three business days later, somebody's going through all the paperwork and calling and saying, do you know grower John Doe? Well, you know, my ex recommendation is, you know, is that you should talk to the police in the sense of, Hi, let me see, what's your name? Take the number, take all the information, or if they leave all that on your voicemail, same exact thing, I'd be happy to follow up and get back to you. Do not actually commit to anything during a telephone phone call whatsoever. Do not, you know, affirm anything, don't deny anything, because, you know, literally what they're doing, they're fishing. They're trying to see what you will and you won't say, take their name, take their number, and then follow up with the individual that is your grower figure out what is actually going on. Is there, was there an actual raid on their place? Did the patient recommendation get seized? You know, find out that information before you start blindly answering questions to law enforcement. And so, literally, if I'm the officer calling, say, hi, you know, I found your patient recommendation after we visited so-and-so, are you in fact his patient? Well, I would be very happy to uh, get back to you a little later. Let me get your name. Your telephone number, I need to do a little investigation on my own end just to make sure that you're a legitimate authority and I will contact you back. Literally, just very simple, straightforward, just like you were dealing with somebody, you know, you were taking a, a message for your roommate, just get the name, telephone number, it's very straightforward. Then follow up with your grower if you actually know him or her. The other weird dynamic sometimes that is occurring is some dispensaries and I'm not saying this is appropriate, but some dispensaries literally just give out patient uh, recommendations without the actual patient in the first place knowing about it. Well, if that ends up happening, you know, you should certainly call the collectives that you're associated with and figure out what the hell is going on, who's giving out my paperwork, and, um, you know, just backtrack over it. But you still don't want to answer any of the questions with law enforcement. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help your, your, your grower. It's not really going to do anybody anything in the short term. Um, once that ball's already started rolling, more than likely your grower will retain an attorney and, you know, kind of figure out the game plan and go forward from there. That's, you know, my best advice is, you know, when that call comes on you, take the info just like you're taking a message for anybody else. Don't, you know, answer any questions. It's not your benefit to deny, not really in your benefit to confirm anything. So that's just the truncated version on what a police call because your provider's arrested. Last one, what to do with law enforcement at your door. Well, this isn't necessarily as straightforward of a question as you would think. There's basically two types of law enforcement encounters. If they're at your door, they're either there because they have a search warrant and they're going to uh, breach the entry anyway. It says search warrant, we're coming in, and we're going to execute it. Option B is they're there because somebody called, uh, called the police on you, a neighbor complaint, or just some other dumb, dumb reason. Police end up coming by. Well, there's two different ways you should deal with these, but they both start off the same exact way. <coughs> Police pounding on your door, and they're saying search warrant. Well, they're going to knock the door in anyways. If they have a search warrant, you know, that door is coming off its hinges. The question becomes, how do you want to deal with this? Well, you buying an extra five, ten minutes while they're pounding on the door, running around trying to destroy all the evidence in this type of case, if you, you know, worst case scenario, you're sitting on a garden, Think about it, not feasibly possible that you could actually get rid of anything of any value. So, I mean, the, the initial reaction of, oh, I'm going to burn my records, toss everything. You know, we're not talking about something you can flush down a toilet and it's gone. We're talking about, you know, substantial infrastructure oftentimes and paperwork and you name it. So, my recommendation, frankly, on a law enforcement encounter where they're pounding on the door is you answer the door. Might as well see that piece of paper. Search warrant will have specifically listed the address that they are entitled to search. Ask them to see it. If you answer the door, they have to show you the search warrant before they are allowed in the premises. It doesn't mean that you won't get, you know, handcuffed when you come to the door, but they still have to show you the search warrant physically. 
my you know experience is, is having that door kicked in on you doesn't really do you any value um, in in the long run, and in fact causes you property damage and out-of-pocket expense. So in terms of the search search warrant service, they're either going to have the warrant or they aren't. And in that dynamic, you know, if they're determined to kick that door in, it's coming anyways. Second one, they're knocking on the door. Hi, local county sheriff or police department. Uh, we had a complaint. Well, if you don't answer that door, that one, and it's obvious you're home, they're going to keep pounding. They don't magically go away. Police have a noise complaint, some other kind of complaint from a neighbor. You're going to have to deal with it. Part of my two cents on dealing with it is the thing you should have thought about in the first place is your front door should be openable and anybody from the public, the neighbor, the police, fire should be able to look in and not see jack shit. Literally nothing. It should look like your house. So that way if you're dealing with anybody and you open the door and you have somebody in your, at your door, your threshold, they don't see anything whatsoever. It is literally, you have to be mindful of the set of that, that your house has to look like a house if you're doing something else inside when you come to the door. At that point you say, yes officer, what can I do? Pull the door shut behind you and have a conversation. If they're there because of loud music, you're like, sorry, I will turn it down. Have a nice day. Then you go back in, turn your music down, and it's all over. If they're there because you're burning something in the fireplace and it smells funny, well, you can try to talk your way out of it depending on how it smells and you know what's going on and how cold it is out there. But realistically, you know, the value of you trying to, you know, talk your way out of that is a little funky. So, I mean, in terms of uh, if they're there just about a complaint like that, you do not have to let them in your door. You do not have to do anything. The reason I say it's, there's value in coming to the door is if you sit there and it's obvious you're home, it's obvious something's going on, they're going to make the worst assumption possible and kick that door in. And they're going to say it was exigent circumstances. It was obvious that somebody was home. As soon as we started announcing it was police, they ended up doing, you know, making furtive or, you know, uh, behavior, and hiding stuff or, you know, we heard racket and, you've, I mean, if you've ever been arrested and seen a police report, you know, it's amazing what they can write in. So, my real experience is, you know, it's worth coming to the door and trying to, you know, jump on that grenade if possible. Sometimes you can actually talk your way out of these things. If it's a noise complaint, you're going to talk your way out of this because they ended up for a d there for a dumb reason. If it's something else, you know, the results might be mixed, but by no means do you have to allow them into the house. Um, that's the three questions that I thought were the most pertinent. Um, I know you want to open up for a question and answer at the end, but I don't know, any questions related to those three things, and then we'll kind of go from there. Chris Roberts, okay, so I'm going to take Brandon and then Chris Roberts, and then I have one thing that I want to say before you close about a current project that's going on. Okay. Ahead. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for going down here. Um, if, if it is a snow complaint or something of that nature and they don't have a warrant, um, is that a probable cause for them to be able to come in or is your house your domain without a warrant? In that dynamic, you know, if they say, oh, we smell marijuana and they're at the door and, you know, they're literally, oh, we want to come in and search. Officer, if you give me just a second, I'd be happy to, pr happy to provide you my medical recommendation. I was just medicating in the living room watching TV. You let me grab it, I'll help, I'll be happy to provide it to you. That's going to be your best dynamic in that situation if it was a smell complaint. You know, if it's one of those dynamics where the house smells 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the neighbors have been complaining for two weeks straight, and then the cops finally show up, you walking out saying I was just burning in the living room probably isn't going to go too far. But just to, like, you know, be realistic, a lot of times, you know, people will call over relatively minor smells, especially in an apartment building. If you, ha you know, you share a... Uh, if you're in an apartment building, you know, sometimes neighbors are just assholes and call over everything. And so, you know, having an actual, you know, your personal recommendation, I can't, I suggest most people, you know, if you have it, stick Wait, it in your wallet. Wait, let me do this again. Everybody raise your hand who has a crazy neighbor. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, I really suggest, suggest putting your uh, recommendation in your wallet next to your ID. That way you just have it, you know, handy at any given time. Because if you're going to choose to, uh, you know, medicate, you might end up needing it, and it's your best defense in this current environment. That also tails very quickly into one other kind of issue that was a question on here, is how do you best uh, avoid police contact in the first place as a patient? 
the other thing is just be smart. You know, don't walk down the street unless you're willing to talk to the officer with the recommendation in your pocket. You know, don't walk down the street smoking. If that's you, if that's your personality and you want to do it, we'll be prepared to at least say, hey, I got my paperwork, I got my ID, no problem here, officer. Um, you know, so you got to gauge your own, you know, decision making process. Uh, but you know, be smart about it. Is my two cents on on law enforcement, Chris, and then I saw somebody behind. You. Fred actually asked a question. I was asking if the smell has been um, deemed adequate probable cause. It says it has. It has. It definitely has been deemed ad adequate probable cause to enter, but especially in the current climate and you know uh, with personal consumption, you know, for medical reasons being allowed in the city, I, you know, you bring out the paperwork and you know usually 15 seconds later they're gone. It's a little different depending on which county you go to. San Mateo is going to give you a hard time no matter what's going on. It's just the nature of the beast there. But in uh, my experience, you know, further you go north, Marin, Sonoma, you know, going on north is, you know, that's the last thing they want to do is write a ticket if they don't have to. And, you know, the recommendation gets them out of having to do anything. And bottom line, you know, a lot of police officers are lazy. You give them a good reason not to, you know, want to uh, round you up. You kind of go, you know, do half their job. I had one. No harm in asking again. A lot of people who got the marijuana cords and they think they can just go out and smoke up and down the street at bus stops and it's all got my cord, I'm not going to jail. Can you explain that to the uh, some of us that, that do that like me? Yeah. <laughs> quick. We live in the lovely city of San Francisco. San Francisco has two types of property. State-owned property and federal-owned property. Federal-owned property. Ocean Beach. Uh, Golden Gate National Recreation uh, Association. You know, uh, Presidio. Uh, you name it. Anything that's federal, you're fucked. Okay. There is no defense. Don't go for it. Don't smoke. You might end up with a nice ranger that actually decides to say, hey, just pack it up and move on. Yeah. Not worth your time. So you hang it out at Ocean Beach at a bonfire down there on the beach. Not your best idea because they're going to roll by. They do roll by very regularly and they enjoy writing tickets. Um, same thing's true for all the federal property here. It's not in your best interest. Even the local federal buildings, like right down the street here, over on Golden Gate, those are all considered federal property, so don't do it. Even on the sidewalk in front of it at the bus stop, no. Um, <laughs> that was for you, Carl. <laughs> Just to say, uh, in terms of state, in terms of the state issue, if like, you know, I want to walk out of here, walk down the street, smoke, well, realistically, it kind of falls under the same kind of restrictions as cigarette smoking does. You stand in front of a business at a cafe, you're going to have the same kind of problems you do with cigarettes. Yeah. But in terms of, let's say you're really just rolling down the street, you're doing your thing, you're probably going to be all right if the police decide to, you know, come over and hassle you, make sure you have your paperwork on it and your uh, photo ID, and they're going to say, have a nice day. Yeah. I mean, that is San Francisco. They should... You know, the one thing I will say is don't drive around in your car smoking. That's a DUI. Right there. Slam, you know. So that's one of the big ones where I see a lot of people in, uh, come to my office because they got the DUI while smoking. Next thing you know, they got somebody going through their whole car and no telling what they find. So that's one of the big ones I really suggest people not to do is not smoke and drive. But um, the bus stop becomes an interesting question because you're technically not allowed to smoke cigarettes at a bus stop. If you notice, most of them have, have those exactly. stickers there. Yeah. That is the worst spot for folks that, like ourselves, who probably don't have cars, don't have the issue of driving in the car. But the last thing you want to be doing is smoking a joint at a bus stop. I mean, it gives. I mean, the cops here are have generally have better things to do. But I will say, if you're hanging out at a bus stop, at, let's say 16th and you know, uh, and a Mission. Oh, yeah. You know, if you're hanging out at a bus stop 16th and 20 or 24th and a Mission, 6th and 6th and Mission. You know, they'll use it as an excuse to to just get you out of the neighborhood. Um, you know, they'll just be uh, call it what it is. You know, that you're giving them an excuse to pick you up and just kind of move you on. That way, they don't have to deal with you the rest of their shift. Let somebody else, you're somebody else's problem. I mean, that's kind of what it comes down to a lot of times is, 
you guys know what what neighborhoods and what corners are actually hot spots? Yeah. Don't lurk there. It's just not worth your time. I mean, they're looking for much more serious drug activity at, like, you know, for example, 16th and, uh, and Mission. They're looking for serious drug activity. But if you're hanging out there smoking a joint, you've kind of given them an excuse to come up and say what's going on, hey. So that's kind of feeds back into the be smart about it. You know, find a better spot than 16th and Mission, you know, uh, 24th and Mission, some places that are already kind of hot spots as it is. I saw a few other hands up. I saw, I'm sorry, what's your name? Genesis, and then I saw my golden Genesis. Genesis? Okay, so what if you get stopped by the cops and you have a photocopy of your doctor's letter, like, but not the original copy? Uh, the question for question Good was question. photocopy of doctor's letter versus original. Uh, the one thing is you're often better off having an original, but photocopies <coughs> work just as well for most officers. Some officers will give you a little bit harder time will for the photo. Will they go on like the website oh, on the letter? Oh. Yeah, there's, they really, I mean, even though they have the confirmation, most, a lot of the recommendations these days say 24 hour internet, uh, you know, uh, yeah. acknowledgement. I mean, they'll look up a license plate, but when they look up a name. It's not in that same database. They, they literally, they literally, when they're looking up a license plate, they literally just they type in the license plate, goes straight to DMV, and it comes back and says, this is Genesee's car, it was bought on this date, it was registered on this date, you got 16 tickets. That's what it says when they run DMV. When they call in, they call in your license, your California uh, CDL. They end up getting your whole criminal history. You know what your prior arrest record are, so they know if oh wow this person's never been arrested, that's fine. It's gonna be a mellow encounter. But this person has 64 arrests, so I'm walking up to the car with my hand on the gun. Yeah. So um, the photocopy generally works. I won't say it's foolproof. Um, San Francisco, you're going to work you know, work a lot better than, than you know, just because San Francisco really doesn't want to deal with the issue. CHP, I have seen them give much harder times to photocopies than to originals. That's, you know, just CHP. A lot of, one thing you kind of run into with CHP, it sends me a lot of ex-military. Yeah. So they're just a little more uptight. Um, so that's, you know, the photocopy question. I saw, um, Mike had a question. Billy had a question. Chris had a question, and then I am going to make one comment, and then we're going to get on to Dean, and then we'll get on to the rest of the training. So we're starting over with Mike, going over to here, and then over there. Uh, Mike. So under the um, Marijuana Offenses Oversight Committee form that we got here, it says, situations where marijuana offenses are not considered lowest law enforcement priority include giving marijuana to adults on public property, including public street sidewalks, parks, buildings, or the public property. So if you're walking down the street with another patient, and you're sharing a joint, is that all of a sudden a problem? The sharing a joint issue is not really going to be a problem as long as you both have paperwork. They're not going to be as concerned about The main, main thing you're talking about is the actual transaction. If they see a hand-to-hand -hand sale and they don't see cash go, doesn't mean they don't think they saw a sale. They saw you giving somebody else a, a bag of marijuana. They aren't going to be too happy about so it. So giving a joint is not a problem, but giving a bag would be a problem. That's going to be viewed worse. I mean, yeah. just think about it, stand back, put your cop glasses on for a second. It might be hard for you, but think about it. Um, <laughs> but they, they, arrested Mark, they, they arrested Mark Emery for passing a joint because he's a political activist. Right. So again, because you're political activists, don't put yourself in that situation. They accused him of um, dispensation when he passed a joint in a crowd. So and not to single out Mike Goldman, but Goldman. he's also on the legal committee and a very well-known activist. So he might not be the person to say pass the joint to Shona right on the street, right? Right. You gotta remember also, you guys, we in San Francisco, they just passed the Sid Light Ordinance. So being outside, doing anything for any long period of time is constitutes the cops to have a reason to talk to you. So Nim minimize your encounters by minimizing what you yeah. do on the streets. That's why you have a community center. Yeah. So you wouldn't be able to get your regular services. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to get my services, so I had to tone it down about the marijuana issue. Because I, I go out there talking about smoking marijuana, veterans smoking. I've had a number of clients say the same thing, a number of vets. Uh, but, let me, but let me ask absolutely. you, why is it that, okay, I have a, 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 another doctor because I have cancer too. But why is it that the VA won't sign the 
the paper, the OK and marijuana card. I mean, you know. It's federal. The VA gets all of their money from the federal government. They get nothing whatsoever from the state of California. All their money comes from D.C. So everything is federal. It's all federal. Um, I mean, there's a few state grants that go into it, but by and large, every let's say 98% of every dollar sent, spent over there comes directly from the federal government. In that situation, we have entirely federal doctors, a federal clinic. You know, they have so no. So you get hired to your federal employee. Absolutely, I have. And you have to follow their rules by the book. I have, I've had people have union grievances working at that very hospital because they want to smoke outside of their employment hours, and then they accidentally test positive on a random test. It becomes a hell of a, of a, you know, kind of a pissing contest, literally, to figure out who, yeah, literally. who wins. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you threaten a lawsuit, it goes kind of back and forth. Sometimes they'll settle out, but, I mean, employees are getting screwed over there, too, not just the patients, and that's why I shared that. Um, I, I had a question Somebody across there. Pass. I just before a point of information, I was going to add some places that definitely you don't want to smoke. UN Plaza. That's federal property, guys. Yep. Don't touch it on, don't even pull it out. Yeah, don't oh, even pull it out.